Hi, Christy. Um, How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, the uh, um, oh, uh, everything's trying to fight against me this morning. Um, the the power went off like 15 minutes before the interview, and then like Windows wanted to um, w wanted to restart, and I'm like, hey, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> Um, but Christy, welcome. Uh, your uh, documentary, Body Parts, will be screening at uh, Tribeca this week. Uh, apologies if I don't know the date right off the top of my head. I literally have like one day where there's like 20 uh, overlapping screenings. So it's like, oh, that's fun. But um, you directed Body Parts. It's a... Um, documentary about the porn industry. Um, and uh, before we get started, I wanted to mention that I saw the uh, your previous short, um, Aquilas, at AFI Docs uh, mm. last year. Um, so I just wanted to say I really appreciated that short last year. I think it was one of the really um, um, more in inventive of the um, shorts that year. But, um, and uh, speaking of AFI docs, really quick, just really quick, because I just remembered this and I keep forgetting this. Um, AFI docs isn't going to be a thing next month. Um, it's being rolled into AFI Fest. So I, if, um, I don't know if you knew about that, but I just wanted to get kind of get your thoughts about that since you direct a lot of documentaries. Oh, well, I didn't really know about that. That's unfortunate. Um, I really love documentary film festivals and hate to see them shrink. <laughs> There's not a lot of them. And AFI Docs was a great one, a long standing. So I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I think that it, it was always interesting that it was geographically split. So maybe centralizing the festival could be a good thing but yeah yeah i think it's like i think afi docs is in like seattle or something and then afi fest is in washington or something like washington D I, I don't remember i've been virtual all this time so um but yeah i i definitely share that sentiment of i think um afi docs being mashed into afi fest kind of creates this weird thing where I think maybe people don't see those documentaries. I, I don't think a lot of people would have seen Summer of Soul if they hadn't um, popped up at other documentary festivals. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. But um, so let's talk about the actual film. Um, we're starting to see a lot more films talk about the porn industry, not even just documentaries. So I, I do want to correct correct you though it's not sure. about the porn it's not a film about the porn industry it's about the making of hollywood sex scenes so i see it as fairly separate from the porn industry which is definitely its own thing with its own sort of community and and qualifiers fair then I will actually skip over this question because I was going to actually ask about pleasure. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on that, but um, um, so I guess uh, what was your, what were the most important things you wanted to discuss in this documentary? Well, this film, like I mentioned, really looks at the making of Hollywood sex scenes and nudity. Uh, from a wide range of perspectives from directors, actors, technicians behind the scenes. And I think it really does so with a, a perspective on what it's been like for women who are the ones who've usually been asked to take their clothes off of what goes into nudity, um, what the stakes are, it's primarily young women, young women that traditionally have been asked to take their clothes off. And the film also looks at how things are changing when women are directing and writing and creating their own stories, centering sexuality and pleasure from their perspective. In the middle of making this film, the Harvey Weinstein scandal erupted 
and Me Too and Time's Up really became part of the national conversation. And a lot of the concerns that I was interested in in regards to the film was suddenly out there in you know the zeitgeist. So it was a really interesting moment and the film has evolved from that. I think one of the great things that has come out of that for the industry is the creation of intimacy coordinators. Those are people like stunt coordinators who are there on set to make sure that there are consensual and safe practices in regards to the performance of intimacy and nudity. And I think that it's just, you know, culturally, we traditionally don't feel comfortable talking about those kinds of explicit conversations what are you still with doing what are your boundaries and I think it's so fascinating that as the industry grapples with some of those conversations so does the rest of the country particularly college campuses um, really parallel conversations about what consent can look like and not to say that you know sex is a bad thing it's just reframing it in a different way yeah, and, and I mean, I, I think the biggest, uh, I think, example of where I, I, I kind of felt uncomfortable for the first time watching something was, I'm sure many people will bring this up today, Game of Thrones. I was just like, you know, does this scene really need to have a rape? Does this really need to be something that is part of her story? Seeing her basically making a lot of females, the victim. I mean, you see this in TV all the time and it's just getting worse and worse. I, I was watching um, the new Halo show um, mm. and there, it, it, it's just getting weird, weirder and weirder on that front where it's like in the first episode, a female uh, takes her clothes off and I'm like, where, what is the motivation in that? in the story for that other than hey we're on a streaming service we can do whatever we want um so i i, I do think um it, it i think intimacy coordinators i think are very are very much overdue um because i mean i mean you look at an hbo show nowadays and it's like hey what what can we do to move the story forward with this young girl and it's like, well, we'll have her have sex. Oh, even so, yeah, I. Um, well, it's, I, I think it's interesting that you bring that up. I mean, instance me, in the C coordination, one part of the puzzle, but like you said, I, in my film Body Parts also goes into this, rape is uh, used as oftentimes as a plot device, especially in series like Game of Thrones. Um, where it, it's like a lazy plot device yeah. too. It's just shorthand for somebody needs to, you know, first of all, we're going to brutalize this woman and then either she herself or sometimes still a, a male counterpart will go and revenge this rape. And it's almost like there is a lack of imagination about how women can be strong and pow powerful without being so brutalized. Um, and I see that over and over again. Yeah, it, it's really unfortunate. Um, so since this is too faceted, I, I, I kind of want to, um, I always like asking documentarians this. Um, so were you, um, when you were making the film, uh, did you, um, seek out the intimacy coordinators? Um, did you, or, I mean, I guess they wouldn't have existed yet at that time. Um, so I guess this is kind of a twofold question. What kind of research did you do? And then what did kind of evolved over the course of making the documentary that maybe isn't in here? Well, it's both a pro and a con that documentaries can take a long yeah. time. Uh, the the benefit is that you can track things that are developing and intimacy coordination you're right ha wasn't a thing when I started making the film and I 
follow the trades very carefully when it comes to the reporting on how sex scenes are made and people have come out and said um, wrote things about how they regret it, which can be the case. And then I also was tracking the rise of intimacy coordination. Theater had had something called sex choreographers who were there to help choreograph, you know, scenes where that was involved and to do so in a way that would, I think, you know, look realistic and protect actors and not necessarily require a, a lot of nudity or con physical contact. Um, yeah. And film really hadn't had that. Film and television hadn't had that, surprisingly. But I, like many documentary filmmakers, I research far and wide. A lot of my research is firsthand accounts. I just started reaching out to actors that I could get access to and, you know, ask them who I should talk to and really just wanted to know, you know, this is particularly women actors, what their perspective was, what was it like? You to these roles? How often were you asked? And, and the things that I heard over and over again, I think are not things that a general audience is really aware of the pressures, especially for a young woman to take her clothes off over and over again. And that there's like this weird arbitrary threshold where if you have just agreed to do it, then you're seen as the person that we asked over and over again to do it. Most of the scripts have that. The other thing I wasn't aware of is that when people are going for auditions, it's one of the first things that are asked. So you have to decide right away if you're going to be willing to do it or not. And, and that can be really, of course, limiting yeah. and, it's like this thing on the table that every person has to decide what they're okay with. And the stakes are very high also in a digital culture where it's going to be extracted on the internet and anybody can find it for a lot of these women. It's the first thing that pops up when you type in their names, yeah. these sort of porn hubs that extract and and give us exactly every frame of their nudity and grades it and rates it. And, you know, for somebody who's a parent or, or even, you know, just a professional, it's you're agreeing to so much more than just what is the context of the film. So there's so much on the table when, when it's being asked of you. And I think it is being asked of so many young actors that are starting out trying to build their career, may not even have representation or people that they can get advice from. So that in itself is, is very difficult. I think to add to that, we, as a culture, because we don't work a little sheepish about toys and desire and that translated translated into the film space and so directors sometimes would not even tell people what the scene was it wasn't written very clearly on the page it just would be like sex scene and you don't know what you're agreeing to yeah. and then on top of that directors would sometimes just say okay well you actors figure it out and that's not the best way to do things it's really there's a lot of potential for danger and harm and, and miscommunication as well so there yeah. were just so many so many ways in which um you know there's pressure and then there's not a lot of communication or explicit conversation around what what it is that you might be even doing yeah for sure because somebody might be okay with something you're not okay with. Um, and to go back to something you said earlier about the digital age where everything can just be uploaded to the internet, uh, we saw uh, examples of this recently in the theater space with, um, I forget his last name, but Noel, um, I forget his name. Um, I wish I, uh, but somebody filmed a sex scene that was supposed to just be, you know, private, and somebody uploaded it to the internet and the theater company had to take 
action because they're like, hey, this is supposed to be a safe space. Um, and even a more famous example is that I forget what the scandal was called, but when all those celebrities iCloud accounts got hacked, there was like a everyone uploaded well not everyone some hackers uploaded all their um nudes and everything and it was just a it, it was just a mess um so yeah it, it there is it's still happening i mean that noel incident happened maybe a week two weeks ago if that um so um it, it's astounding how often it happens um so I guess this is a kind of cliche question, um, but I'll ask, what would you like to see moving forward um, in the industry, both in real life and in the film industry? Well, I think that one of the things the film does advocate for is standards, standardization of intimacy and intimacy coordination, that there's clear guidelines um, and that it becomes a regular practice when there is intimacy and nudity that this sort of third party person will be there again like a stunt coordinator to have these conversations and check in with people and um, make sure that you know body parts are appropriately covered it's a it's a it's a tricky line with performance because while you're not really in, in these, in this Hollywood context, you're not really having sex with each other, but you really are touching each other. Yeah. And so it's such a unique position. I think for audiences, uh, my hope is that they learn more about these changes, but that they also think about, you know, what goes into the making of these films, what actors are being asked to do almost like you would an ingredients list, you know, what, what harm was done in the making of this film or how were people treated? Um, and I think finally, I wanna introduce audiences to women creators that are not abashed about showing sex and sexuality and desire, but are doing it from a, a uniquely, um, a uniquely woman's perspective. Um, so we kind of conclude the film with different examples of current shows. Cause it's not that we want to say it's like bad or anything. We want to really celebrate it and just diversify who gets to be sexy, how sex is shown. Um, and that it's something that is the kind of sex education for the mass audiences. Well, thank you so much for your time, Christy. Uh, anyone at home can check this out, this documentary out on uh, June 14th. But if you're in Tribeca, uh, you can check it out June 12th at the Angelica, June 13th at the Tribeca Film Center, and June 16th at the Cineopolis. Cine <laughs> um, but thank you again so, so much for coming on, Christy. Thank you, my pleasure.